Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Uh, this is Logist in Vietnam, and here we're um, here to discuss a panel on supply chain and sustainability disruption to opportunity. Um, I'm here with my fellow panelists. We have Rose Samanego, sorry if I've mispronounced that role, uh, Director of Supply Chain ASEAN of the AGAE Group Bangkok in Thailand. We have Dr. Renard Siu, Climate Change Advisor, the Seventh Centre for Governance and Political Studies in KL in Malaysia. And Francis Xavier Joe, General Manager, Acuvio Asia Malaysia. Are you based in KL as well, Francis? Uh, yes, Stephanie. Yes, and so I'm based out of Singapore, so we have quite a diverse group here across the ASEAN region, which is fantastic to see. Um, now, earlier today, I had actually included in my presentation during my keynote that, um, you know, we had asked questions of our um, manufacturers and, and logistics companies in the region. And, and with the manufacturers, we asked from a supply chain risk mitigation perspective, where is the focus at your company? Now, the first response that came back, as I pointed out this morning, was that the, um, you know, the spotlight, it is, uh, there is a spotlight on supply chain visibility, um, direct materials, finished goods sourcing, um, you know, these, these are common responses that we expect to see, you know, in the current time as a direct result of COVID-19 and, and being an area of focus for risk mitigation. However, what is interesting is that we've seen sustainability rise to number two for ASEAN manufacturers as a, as a focus for supply chain risk mitigation. Now, you know, why is this important? It's because, you know, um, in recent analysis, IDC has found that those manufacturers that combine digital transformation with sustainability efforts have had higher levels of revenue and profitability um, than when compared with those that don't undergo digital transformation and don't um, undergo sustainability initiatives. Um, in the same survey, manufacturers in Asia Pacific also indicated that the ability to adopt or adapt new business models is key to digitally transforming their supply chains. A failure to embrace sustainability and digital transformation is likely to result in lagging financial performance moving forward. Um, we're also seeing that governments are considering sustainability as part of COVID-19 re uh, recovery plans. Um, companies will need to adapt to drive changes that will include the consideration of these stakeholders as part of economic activities. But here we're seeing examples such as clean transportation, renewable resources, um, shortening and diversifying supply chains. And in adopting to these measures, companies will need to implement systems that allow for traceability at scale and sustainability reporting without adding an administrative load to the business. So today here in this panel, I'm looking to um, you know, address some of the questions that we have around this with my panelists. Um, what I'll do is I um, will start with a poll, just a very simple poll for any attendees that are uh, listening. Um, hang on, let me just add my question, which is uh, asking, um, I'd like the audience to answer the question, is sustainability uh, uh, is sustainability actually a focus for your organisation? So if you could just take a moment just to, to click on the link that uh, you should see a poll uh, at the bottom and if you could just uh, respond and we'll see the, the responses come through. So we've had one that said no, very strong no. And I think for some organisations, uh, sustainability could still be considered to be greenwashing, yes? What do you guys think? Are we still seeing greenwashing out in the... Oh, somebody unclicked. <laughs> Dr. Renato, are we still, still seeing uh, greenwashing out in the industry? Oh, um, I, I think certainly there are certain parts of, well, there are organizations that, you know, embark sustainability, you know, just, just for the sake of, you know, like a, a piece of, you know, some of the investments that you sort of put NGOs on hold. Uh, but when you start drilling down and looking at your real operation or, or how they have actually conducted uh, sustainability in terms of their strategy, uh, then, then you will start realizing that there is actually a great practice. So I think, I think greenwashing is the best Okay, right. So, um, well, let's have a, have a let's uh, uh, go into some of the questions that we have, which is, um, you know, uh, Maybe Francis, you can answer this. What is the consensus on sustainability that you see? So, uh, 
you know, we, we've asked and we saw a one no come up. So, um, you know, we, we, we do still see that some organisations are not interested in sustainability. But are um, manufacturers and logistics companies in ASEAN concerned about it? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think um, in terms of, um, you know, I've got like about, you know, like six points to add here. Mm -hmm. um, what I noticed, because I do the software and I talk to a lot of clients in this part of the region, what I noticed is that among at least the bigger players, right, uh, they are beginning to actually understand uh, uh, the climate change, energy transition, digitization and technology disruptions are uh, rapidly creating new expectations of them among their customers, which are the buyers and also the end consumers, that's number one. And number two is that among the same players, all right, the bigger players, they are also beginning to see that what is sustainable and what is economical can mean the same thing. And they're beginning to accept that, you know, represents the best long-term interest for them. Mm -hmm. And at the same time in the ecosystem which they operate in, which is the planet and society. Uh, this view is actually consistent with the uh, stakeholder rather than the shareholder view of capitalism that's evolving now. Uh, but when you go down to to the lower tiers, all right, maybe the um, the local corporates and the SMEs, uh, what I find is that they are practicing sustainability only to a limited extent, uh, with minimal significance to the entire business process. Normally, for such firms, uh, they adopt sustainability more for regulatory compliance purposes, like example, health and safety, air pollution. Um, there was a report done by HSBC in uh, 2018, you know, um, they say that only 24% of ASEAN respondents had ESG sustainability as a corporate strategy compared to 40%, 48% of global corporates globally, all right, and a very high 87% of European and UK companies. So because of the very high um, ESG sustainability consciousness among the EU market, now, I think that the ASEAN companies, corporations, all right, I think you mentioned that they are beginning to actually escalate sustainability to rank number two. Uh, they have to keep in mind that EU currently, all right, they are planning to introduce this thing called a carbon border adjustment mechanism. It's a kind of tax, tax structure, which they are, which the, the aim is actually to penalize greenhouse gas pollution produced by factories outside the EU region. They ship their products into the Europe or the EU, EU nations. Uh, the underlying reason for this is that the 27 block of EU uh, block is that they are tightening the uh, 2030 Paris climate commitments. They're pushing up that target from 45 previously reported in uh, nine uh, previously reported. Now they push it up to 55 percent. So this means that you know in order to protect the domestic industries most at risk from EU's stricter climate policies. So they've introduced this tax system. So the question becomes is that, okay, is, is EU an important market for ASEAN manufacturers? Uh, uh, 2016 statistics mentions that uh, exports into EU market stands about 146 billion. It's almost about 15% of ASEAN's total exports. So in conclusion, all right, what I'd like to say is that this means ASEAN companies, they need to embrace sustainability in terms of supply chain strategy. They need to start to report and disclose. And when they start to report and disclose, then they will find is that they'll find opportunities that comes from savings in terms of energy consumption, or energy efficiency. And this will help them actually to remain competitive with, with the higher climate change regulations. So that's what I observe, Stephanie. Yeah, I, I, I see with that. It sounds like the carbon border adjustment mechanism is, is like a, a carbon tariff, if you like, so yeah. that they can compete yes. against the, the EU um, uh, companies. So, um, you know, and, and, and I think there's two fronts here is one is that you're going to um, lose out on potential customers um, if you're not able to, to maintain compliance. But the other opportunity is that, you know, if you, if you do implement, then you do, you know, have a competitive advantage against some of your competitors, yeah? Right. Um, now, Dr. Renata, are you seeing companies take up sustainability? Yeah, um, yeah, Stephanie, this is a very interesting question. What I 
team, at least in Southeast Asia, is that there's quite a wide range of spectrum, or if you like, maturity level in terms of how operations or companies actually adopt sustainability within the organization. Um, I think at, at its lowest level of maturity, like a lot of companies do it primarily as just a PR exercise. So, you know, there's a lot of commitments that are being made, uh, public disclosure saying that you commit to X, Y, and Z. But when you're actually scrutinizing and looking at your real operations, uh, you will notice that you know, there is quite a bit of gap in where they are. And, and this goes back, back to the, you know, the point that I made earlier about, you know, greenwashing. Like, and most often than not, like, I think, I think they are, companies are still in fact. However, having said so, I think uh, they are also uh, organizations that are on the other end of the thing, like where they're actually doing right thing for the right purpose. And a lot of this, you know, when I speak to Kate's capability from, from such organizations, they do highlight a couple of key drivers. Some of them have also been highlighted by uh, Hansen, like earlier, about having, you know, adopting the stakeholder as a shareholder approach. So really looking at who are the different parties that could by your business. You know, what is the role of the market? You know, Malaysia, like first of Malaysia, you know, Singapore stock exchange, all part of the network of uh, green financing uh, capital, like where they're trying to encourage uh, you know the public listed operations to adopt very strong ESG, environmental social and governance uh, and, and, and they also the role of what needs to be mentioned is the, the role of civil society organization. There is a stronger in terms of uh, activism on that front, like where they are fighting for more transparency on sustainability issues. Um, and, and companies that, that actually do look at them seriously, they would have you know, a set of strategy or roadmap in place. Uh, you know, they, they would have a strong government structure. Uh, very often than not, like uh, the board of directors would be involved. Like they are very clear that their fiduciary duty is not primarily just make you know as much, profit, but also uh, in that the process of doing so, how are you impacting both the planet and the people? Uh, and then and, and and it's very clear by like, the proposition here that there is simply no economy without you know a di on, on a dying planet, or if you're constantly exploiting people, you're involved in you know, child labor, uh, vacation of workers, uh, you, you know, it ends up in a uh, situation for all. Uh, you know, sustainability is becoming, you know, coming to the center, it is becoming uh, more, and hence, it doesn't surprise us that when you mentioned that sustainability and supply states sort of took on, like, the second of the series uh, by, by a lot of uh, companies. Great, thank you. Now, now, both Dr. Renard and Francis, you both mentioned the stakeholders versus shareholders um, focus. Francis, maybe you could explain a little bit what you mean by that. Okay, I think traditionally we talk about finance, right? Um, the, 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 what you call that, the responsibility of the board or the company is to maximize profits for the shareholders. So what you find today is that, you know, the, um, if you look at um, social factors or environmental factors. So because the focus is on maximizing uh, returns of shareholders, so you, what you have done is you have not, you have not taken care of the, the other two pillars, the planet and the environment. So because of that, what you find now is that, you know, if you look at the Paris Climate Agreement, okay, climate change is a big, big issue, right? So you need to start to address that, right? So what happens now is that there is actually a big push for companies, right, even the boards, the management, to look beyond shareholders, to look into all stakeholders. So you have your what? You have your supply chain. You also have your employees to take care of, and you also have your employees to take care of. So if you look at Malaysia, for example, if you look at top gloves. I mean, they are doing very, very well in terms of gloves, all right? But they are actually facing an issue about, you know, accommodation for their foreign workers. So that's becoming actually an issue. So what you find now is that even the government, Malaysian government actually, um, because of COVID-19 also shutting down the operation. So this has actually an impact on top plus performance and also into the reputation. So what you find is that with the increase in, in the attention of social media, so you find that you might make a lot of profits. For example, like top make a lot of profits, but you find that you got deficiency in terms of your employee treatment and they'll be flagged off. 
And I think um, even the US, what the US done is that they've actually stopped purchases from top level. Yeah, so that's, that's 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, um, for our next question, I just uh, uh you know, move on to um, from a business compliance because that's something that you also both mentioned was looking at the compliance. Um, are there increased compliance requirements in the regions and how are companies dealing with this and what implications does it have for the supply chain? Um, Ro, perhaps you could step in first here. Oh, yes, yes, Stephanie, thank you. Yes, for sure increase the compliance requirements in the region, uh, I would say especially during these uh, COVID times maybe not enough in comparison with other developed regions, but yes, with a great acceleration, right? Uh, I would say in the whole supply chain, we can see different and significant compliance risk. Uh, I would say in that re in, 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 in ASEAN principally, uh, including corruption, uh, about fraud, about export and import, you know, in, the, in the customs, in the border, also um, about the labor law compliance, for example, in the case of Thailand, we have a lot of labor from the neighbor countries. Um, also, in, in terms of uh, suppliers, there's more emphasis in the, in, the, in the evaluation, more scrupulous. So I think the, the, the global supply chain now is facing historic disruption. We will see, and, and we are seeing during this year, and maybe in the next three or five years, uh, more change that we saw in the last 20 years. That's why uh, I think this uh, sustainability and compliance uh, issues are affecting and impacting all the tiers of the supply chain. But uh, many companies are limited to measuring the sustainability of their own business operations, mm, are still unable to extend this evaluation to their suppliers or the supplier, their suppliers and the customers. Uh, and this is a challenge because normally supply chain are uh, looking for reducing cost, just in time, inventories. But now uh, this is an opportunity, no? they say that it's a disruption to opportunity to, to redesign the supply chain in the different levels and also how to optimize a major shortening this supply chain in order to to can say is this uh, the, these opportunities I, I would say also it's very important in order to to deploy and achieve uh, the, the, the compliance is a, a, a huge um, focus in the culture right in the culture of the organization very important from from the C-suite cascade top down. And after that, go to the next level. That is more the benchmarking to the audits. Now have more tools than in the past, more uh, visibility, the use of this digitation, a big data will help so much in, in this um, in, in this journey. Yeah. Uh, sorry, if I can just very quickly jump in. Like, I also wanted to, to highlight the fact that, you, you know, we have seen actually an emergence of uh, sustainability frameworks, guidelines, and tools that have really surfaced in the past decade. Some of them are industry specific, some of them are sort of federal uses. And, and I, to, to a certain extent, I, one of the things that has been brought up is sometimes this sort of create you know, special who are a practitioner that's trying to apply some of the sustainability framework into your own, you know, supply chain. Just because there's so many of these this tools that, that are available, you know, like which ones do you prioritize? You know, which ones do you have to go for? And are they also harmonized? And I think I think a lot of I think there needs to be a lot of effort like around this, this area, just so that you know, just to make sure that some of the benchmarks and guidelines that, that we have right are, are sort of tuned and, and aligned with. Uh, yeah, I've I've been talking to someone who was talk uh, uh, saying that. You know, there, there is uh, some bias, for example, in some of the tools that are being used. If, if you are manufacturing in, in Asia, for example, you automatically get a mark against you because, you know, you may not have the, there's a perception that you may not have a compliant supply chain. Whereas, you know, in, if you are Europe, you automatically get an, uh, you know, and this is just what they, the, the impression that they have and, and they're losing out in business for that. And I don't know. You know, this is this is a, a, a an observation that we're hearing from there. Is you know, does, 
you know, France, you're in the, the software business and, and that. Do you know if this is occurring or, um, uh, or no. there is this harmonization that, that uh, Dr. Renard is talking about? Okay, in terms of harmonization, because like Dr. Renard had mentioned, there's actually a lot, a lot of frameworks out there. And what you see is that the frameworks are actually competing with each other. Uh, but because now what you find is that the investor group, the fund managers actually come in and being interested in ESG uh, data. So they're actually asking, all right, for in, for data that's harmonized across the framework. So some of these major frameworks like you know, GRI, SA, SB, uh, TCAB and all that, they come together and they say that they want to harmonize because there are actually a lot of uh, opportunities to harmonize. So they've actually uh, uh, put out a statement saying that they want to harmonize it. Yeah. So in terms of what you mentioned, in terms of like the um, the biasness so far, um, based on what I've seen, I haven't heard of that yet. You know, if we actually if we apply some of the uh, more of the uh, international standards, like for example CDP and all that. So what you find is that they kind of track across the region, different regions. So I do really see a biasness there, but um, never know what happens actually at the practical level. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and, and also it's quite quite a scary situation if you think about it. I mean, there's this whole rise in of you know, like talk around socially responsible investing, ESG practices. We know that trillions of dollars are literally invested based on assessment outcomes of the schools. So if they're not harmonized, you know, like, sort of raise the, the question around as logistical. How, how, how do you know that your company company A is performing better than company? for example, and you're allocating a lot, a lot of pension funds actually look into this very, very seriously. A lot yeah. of money has been has been invested. And I think this is something that, you know, really needs to be uh, taken with, with a lot more weight. Agreed. You know, if, if people are basing investment decisions for funds saying that this is a sustainable fund, then, then you know, there's got to be auditors out there that can to make sure that that is, that is harmonized in and by itself. Now, now, speaking of the investment and the money making side, I mean, um, uh, there are business opportunities with regards to sustainability. Um, Role, perhaps you could share. Do you know any uh, or how organisations are actually, um, you know, embarking on sustainability as a business option or, or making, you know, taking advantage of the opportunities? Yes, yes. Uh, as I said, this is an opportunity for the for for value creation opportunities and for significant competitive advantage for early adopters and for for process innovators. Uh, as I said before, normally we are uh, uh, pressure about the uh, reduce the cost, about the uh, uh, deliveries, but now we not only we did co this context also because the consumer are requesting eco-friendly products and the perception of the, uh, the empowerment of the consumer change. This is like, uh, uh, we need to have an understanding about the, the sustainable supply chain, also mean profitable supply chain. We have good opportunities there. Uh, one of the biggest opportunities is the reduction of, of intermediaries in the, in the process, for example, with uh, some natural products. We can go directly with a producer. We can increase the profit of the producer and also we can have a uh, better and more effective feedback about the, the produce by itself. We have a very good experience with the producers of aloe vera in the region when we have the direct contact with them. Also, a good opportunity is about um, the collaboration, right? Because uh, normally uh, everybody knows that the cooperation and collaboration is a key factor in supply chain. But many times the companies are fear about to to share, for example, transportation, for share some initiatives, because they fear to lose the control of the commercial operations. But I think we have a lot of room to, to improve and to take advantage for, for example, reduce the emission of pollution, uh, uh, sharing transportation, uh, and, and this also will impact in our cost. So I think it's about to think, to think uh, in a different way and think also that this, uh, opportunity and the sustainability also can make more profitable the supply chain. Yeah, and I, I think we're also seeing opportunities where, you know, larger organizations are looking to, you know, bring things like renewable power generation onto their own um, uh, properties or sites and then looking at ways that they can sell that back into the grid, for example. I mean, you know, we, we are a little bit away from that. I think there's going to be, um, you know, need for digital grid management and, and other capabilities before 
um, we're able to do that. But I think there, there are certainly opportunities that companies are looking for from the, that energy. And, and you have mentioned the resource uh, uh, resource management, you know, trying to keep resources low. You know, I'll never forget walking into a shopping center and, and over the toilet paper roll, seeing a sign saying, use less, you're saving trees. And in my mind, I'm going, use less, you're saving me money. Um, so <laughs> and it, it, there, there are very strong parallels between these sort of, um, you know, uh, savings that are involved. But I think, you know, looking at, at the opportunities that are available from a sustainable perspective, you know, organizations are seeing, you know, things like the ability to set up frameworks and, and put in metrics and, and measure and develop software around that. There are other organizations that are seeking to, to, to provide consultative, um, you know, efficiency for organizations so that they can um, take advantage of this. There are other organizations that are, are looking at pooling uh, resources. So being able to, to you know, pool trucks and pool uh, warehouses and, and pool other infrastructure. So, so you know, there are uh, definitely a lot of opportunities, I think, around this space. Now, I think we only have time for um, one more question. So I'll, uh, for instance, if maybe you can answer this, uh, how can companies manage sustainability requirements easily? You know, that this is the thing, right? It's, if, if it was easy, then we would be doing it already, right? Yeah, yes. I mean, what I like to say is that, I mean, sustainability tends to be a new topic, all right? Um, but I like to look at it, you know, from the angle of opportunities, all right? So let me just quote you an example. Uh, CDP, all right, they, every year they do a, a survey. Um, according to CDP's supply chain survey of report 2018-2019, uh, what they've done is that they have actually polled about, they sent out questionnaires about 11,000 uh, customers. About 47% of them uh, came back with the answers and most of these companies report on scope one and scope two. So the emissions for these companies was about 7 billion metric tons of CO2. Uh, what's the size of it? Like, you know, the combined emissions of United States and Canada. Uh, but what I like to emphasize is that, okay, this is the amount of emissions they've emitted, but the amount of savings that they have realized, the right, in terms of emissions was 633 million metric tons. And this is the clicker, right? Is that, you know, by doing this energy efficiencies and taking sustainability as a business opportunity, they've realized savings of 19.3 billion US dollars. So what this means is that sustainability delivers business benefits. So let's take you mentioned, you went to shopping complex and you saw what, the toilet paper saying that use less toilet paper. So that's actually, yes, it's sustainable for the, for the environment. At the same time, the companies themselves are achieving cost savings in them. Right. So coming back to the question of like, you know, how do you companies manage sustainability requirements more easily? I'm just going to give you a very, some very practical uh, examples, not to get uh, too complicated. All right. So what I would say is that, you know, engage in green procurement. So what you need to do is that start reviewing existing purchasing uh, policies, processes to ensure that you source for goods and services from your own suppliers and vendors that are not only really environmental friendly, but at the same time, they are also socially responsible. So you talk about environmental friendly, you talk about, maybe you talk about sustainable packaging, uh, you talk about socially uh, friendly, you talk about living wages and also workers' accommodation, which is coming to the fore these days. That's number one. And number two is that establish sustainability culture across the entire organization. So sometimes what you find is that, you know, the conversation happens at the top, it doesn't get filtered down to the bottom. So to take sustainability from organizational policies and procedures and get it down to a personal level, I would suggest is that, you know, foster a culture of sustainability within departments and also within teams, right? And some of the ways you could do that is that maybe you have employee engagement strategies, like maybe you have a recycling, and then you also have programs around maybe energy savings initiatives. So that's number two. And number three is that, you know, uh, I'm also glad to say you know, uh, here that sustainability is number two rank. So this means is that, you know, make sustainability an important parameter to every organizational strategy. So what happens is that over time, such a system will steadily make people take sustainability into account by default. It does something that they are forced by compliance. And number four, I would like to say is that, you know, you must do reporting and also disclosure. And I would always like to recommend GRI because it's the most globally accepted standard. So yeah. when you start to do reporting and disclosure, what you find is that you're going to identify opportunities for savings, all right? 
and that's where you're going to realize cost savings and you're going to be competitive and then since i've been selling a software i would suggest that look into going into digital reporting and going to cloud computing cloud storage so what digital technology does is that it helps to break down silos increase transparency and also unify data for objective and agile decision making what I normally see is sustainability is done as a year-end activity for compliance sake, right? And it does need to be a continual one. Yeah. Continual. And I'm going to have to cut you there because I'm getting a lot of nods from, uh, from the organizers that we have actually run out, the, uh, okay. run out of time. But uh, certainly try and uh, grab Francis in one of the breakout uh, tables or, or in the, the speed networking that's available if you're interested in this. Um, so, so sorry to cut you off there, Francis, and, and no problem. Dr. Raul and Dr. Renard for your time today. Thank you to everyone, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. Thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks. Bye, Raul. Bye, Renard. Bye, bye.